There we go. Um, executing the race plan. Just like practice, speak with the coach before the race. Doesn't help after. What should I have done? Well, it doesn't, doesn't matter now. It's over. Race is over. Um, but, you know, racing is different. In the spring, you line six boats up, throw the gun, it's a sprint to the end. Okay? I mean, it's just, it's literally a sprint to the end. Um, so, you know right off the line where you are. You know everybody in your race. You know? If you're on the outside lane and you look and there's five lanes across and you're like, you know, I've got Michigan, Michigan State, you know, I've got uh, Georgetown, Villanova, and, you know, UCLA. You're like, oh, okay. Um, and as the coxswain, you need to know who's in your heat. You know, need to know which lane they're in. Because what the last thing the crew wants to know, or the last thing the crew wants to hear, is for you to say the wrong name of the crew that's next to you. So if, in, if you're in lane six and in lane three is Yale, and you call them out as Georgetown, there might be somebody in your boat who hates Yale. Okay? And if they hear that you're beating Yale, you're going to get an extra effort out of them, okay? Because they didn't get into Yale or whatever it was. Um, same thing. Or, you know, you've got the, you know, you've got the Georgian team next to you, you know, and you're representing the U.S. and you want to beat the Georgians for whatever reason. Um, it's the same sort of thing. So you need to know who's in which lane. And um, going into a race, your, your coach will be able to talk to you and say, look, you know, I know that in the middle thousand is where, you know, uh, Villanova tends to soften up. And if we're going to make a move on Villanova, if we've got a chance on Villanova, it's in that middle thousand, all right, out of a 2,000 meter race. So you need to be looking for that marker. So you just crossed the 500 meters down, so you got 1,500 to go. I'm entering that middle thousand. You look across the course on both sides of you and you're like Villanova's bow ball to bow ball with us and I got three other boats behind me now's my chance but my race plan says I don't take a 20 until I hit the thousand but I just crossed the 500 what do I do? You're the coxswain you gotta make that call you either tell them we're, we're stroke for stroke with Villanova we're rowing a 32 and we're holding them or you hear Villanova call for a 10 and you say Villanova just called for a 10 they're not taking any seats on us we're holding them that motivates your crew because they know that they're taking a 10 but you're still holding them once they finish their 10 you match their 10 but you match their 10 only if you're gonna take them and then when you do you say we just took a seat on them we just took another seat we're half a deck up we're two seats up on them. I got half a boat on them. We just opened water. That's what they want to hear. Those kind of updates. Know the race plan. We were just talking about that. Know what your race plan is. What's your start? What's your settle? Where are you strongest? And where are you weakest? Because other crews are going to look for where your weak points. They're going to study you. They're going to try to understand who you are, they're going to watch you the day before in warm-ups, they're going to watch you that morning, um, and they're going to try to understand where, where, how, do I, how do I find a weak point in that crew. Um, but the race plan, the reason there's an asterisk is because sometimes you got to throw it out the window. And as the coxswain, you got to make that call. I'll tell you, early on in your coxswain career, if you if the coach tells the whole boat the race plan, which they often do, and somewhere along the way you throw it out the window and you don't perform well, your crew will come down on you really hard. They're like, what'd you do? We had a race plan. You abandoned that. We were supposed to take a 20 at the 1,000. You didn't say a word. What happened? We came in fourth. We needed to get third to advance. You threw that out. But you had your reason. Why did you do it? I don't know. 
They weren't rowing well. You missed it. You panicked. Hopefully it's none of those. But you decided something different. That's why you have to be so keen when you're out there. Similarly, when you're in a head race, okay, you're going to have a race plan, but you're going to find opportunities that are going to come up that you didn't necessarily expect were going to come up. A boat, somebody jumps their seat, okay? Now they're dead in the water. You blow by them, okay? And you talk to the crew that you're blowing by this other crew. You don't have to tell them they jumped their seat, okay? You just say, we just took, you know, uh, Grand Valley State, okay? We just passed them. Yay! Now they're pumped. They know they made up 10 or 15 seconds and they're ready to go. Um, but you took a 10 there, even though you didn't need to take a 10 and it wasn't part of the race plan. But you did that. Um, you gotta motivate your crew. <laughs> you gotta find you gotta find those words, those ways of doing it. The worst thing I think a coxswain can do is talk the entire time. Just don't be this chatterbox. Just don't be out there, blah, 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 because it all blends together. And the only thing they're going to hear is blah, 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 10, blah, 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 you know, finish. Like they're not going to hear anything. So you have to be, you have to know what you're going to, what you want to say before you say it and what's going to motivate them. Um, it can be a phrase, it can be how you say it. Um, sometimes it's nothing. Some, you know, I used to take it, I'd say, we're going to take, a, you know, a personal 10. Personal 10. Next 10 strokes. And what I'd say is I'd count like one, two, and then I'd go quiet, and then I'd go nine, ten. Heads in the boat. And I'd give them an update where we are. So we finish that, and then you'd say, okay, you know, we are two seats down on, you know, uh, Michigan, and, you know, we're three seats up on Georgetown, okay? And we just crossed the 750 mark, all right? So they know where they are. They're getting those updates. Um, crews really want to know in a race where they are. A head race is so much longer than a sprint race. I mean, it's a marathon, you know? Three, three and a half mile races, they're rowing for, you know, 16, 17, 18 minutes. This is a long time at power. So they want to know, we're, we just passed the one mile mark. Okay, we got two to go. All right, I kind of know where I am with my body. I know how I'm feeling. The boat's feeling a little soft maybe. So when the coxswain calls, you know, we just hit the... the the one mile mark, I want to take a fresh legs 10. Let's get on those legs fresh. Think about it like we're just starting the race again for 10. Boom, you know you go 10. Um, it's those kinds of things that you need to do. Um, again, I know I keep using the head of the Charles, but it's very easy on the head of the Charles because the banks are lined with people. It's like the Super Bowl, you hear screaming all the time. You're going under bridges. You know, there's people with banners, you know, I mean, it's just nuts. You know, at normal regattas, you hear, yay, for, you know, 150 meters, and then it's silent. You know, you don't hear anything, so. Oh, you're right. My fault. Keep talking. Okay. Work. I can't work with that. Um, <laughs> and so, um, the, uh, so the cheering, you know, you're not going to hear other than at some of those larger events, you know. Sprint races in the spring, when you get to the finish line, sometimes they have the grandstands and some of the other things and you'll hear the cheering. But really, rowing's not a cheering sport. Um, so you gotta find ways to motivate them. Um, biggest thing, never lie. Kind of okay. Life, What's that? Kind of a, lot of a lot of ways in life. So here's the worst thing you can do. Worst thing, 20 strokes to go. 20 strokes are up. 20 more. And they're like, what? I just gave you everything I had. You said there was 20. What do you mean there's 20 more? All right, so you need to know about how long does it take you to row that race. Is it a 14-minute race? Okay, and if you're rowing at a 30, 
okay? How many strokes before you cross that finish line? If you're on a 30, at 30 strokes per minute, that's one minute to go, I got 30 strokes to go, so right at about 40 seconds, I got 20 strokes, okay? I got about 20 strokes right in there, you know? You, if nothing else, take your last stroke when two seat is crossing the line, okay? You're, well, you're plenty across the line when you say 10 or 20, whatever it is, when your last number is counted, all right? Um, don't lie to a crew. They hate it when you lie. Um, and it's just the worst, it's the big, it's the fastest way to erode confidence in you, all right? Like, if you say, you know, anything during a race that's a lie and it comes back that it was clearly a lie, it's going to haunt you. During a practice, don't, you know, don't sugarcoat it, okay? If they sucked, tell them they sucked. I mean, don't say the word you suck, but just say that wasn't anywhere close to half power. All right, there's a, when we row at half power, I know what it feels like to be in this seat. I get sh shoved back in my seat when we're really catching and we're really driving those legs. Or, um, and we weren't doing that. But call them out on it, all right? They don't want, it, they don't want to hear that it's good because if they know it wasn't good, they'll, they'll be like, dude, you're lying. I know you're lying. So, um, and so it's, it's really bad to do that. Try to keep as honest as you can with whatever your criticisms are or whatever feedback they give you. Mm. If you don't know, say I don't know. You don't have to know everything. You just don't. I mean, it's like, I don't know. You know, what's Tom going to do for practice today? And you rattle something off, and I come up and I'm like, we're going to do this. And they're like, well, I thought we were going to do four, four two-minute pieces, you know, and now you're telling me we're going to do... 10 eight minute pieces, that's a big difference. You know, I mean, like, they were motivated for one thing and then they're like, and then they're gonna get off and go, Karen, you told me we were gonna do that, what happened? Well, I, I don't know, I just thought that's what we were gonna do. So, that sort of stuff erodes. Any questions? That's an important thing. In order to win, you need to be willing to do something that the other crew is not. Is that a little harder on your legs? Is that sitting up taller? Is that staying 10 minutes after practice to get on the erg? Is that saying to your coach, that wasn't a good enough piece, we want to do one more because we know we can do better? What is it? Oh, look at that. That's ugly. Again, mulling around. Think of all of the money right there. <laughs> I mean, you know, these, there's, a, there's an empocker, there's an empocker, there's an empocker, here's one. You know, those come over, you know, flown over from Germany. You got a couple of Vespos in here. I don't see a red. That might be a resolute. Um, that was a lot of money. Um, as a coxswain, how do you feel looking at that? <laughs> a little stressed, huh? Yeah. The, the, the rowers don't see that, okay? Because they don't know, other than what's behind them, they shouldn't really be, and they shouldn't really be looking out. So you can say, be saying inside, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, but you can't let them know, all right? That's one of those things. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you're at, at regattas where you don't have a lot of space. They just don't have good space planning. They think they can put 30 boats in a space made for 10. And so everybody's like jockeying for position and, you know, colorful words come out, oars hit each other. I mean, it just gets ugly. Um, so it'll happen. So I guarantee in the spring for the high schoolers, when you go to some regattas, it's going to be like this. And you're going to be like, that was a nightmare. That was a nightmare. So, um, race day warm up should be similar to a normal day warm up, standard warm up. It might vary slightly only because you know you don't want to get to the line and have people panting heavy. Okay, so when you're 
doing a head race or a sprint race, you don't want them to be like, oh, oh, oh. you know, it's like, dude, we got 2,000 meters left to go, you know, you just gave me your whole thing on the warm up, you don't want to do that. Similarly, you don't want to have them get up there and they're like, that's it, that's all we're going to do, you know, so you've got to have a balance between what is too much and what's not enough. Um, one thing that plays a factor is weather. So I've been at regattas where it's 85, 90 degrees on the water, okay? And they are sweating like pigs before they even step into the boat, much less get to the start line. So they got water, they're drenched. There's obviously no shade on the water, okay? So they're hot. What do you want to do as a coxswain? You don't want to exhaust them, okay? But the worst thing that can happen is there's a race delay and everybody's stuck out there. And I was down, uh, we were rowing in Tennessee on the Tennessee Valley Authority. It was a sprint race. Um, it was the uh, CIRAS, Southern Interclash, Inter Intercollegiate Rowing Association, regatta. Great course, like uh, clear crystal water got down to where the start line is, like the staging area for the start line, and there are these cows that are in the water, and they're like mulling around, and you're avoiding cows, and you know, a launch comes over and goes, uh, there's gonna be about a half an hour delay on the races. Um, we've got, uh, we gotta clear some cattle out at the finish line, and we're like, what? <laughs> so some cattle had wandered in at the finish line, and I don't know how you corral a cow in the water but somehow they had to get them to the shore so um, so but that happened you know but so we were out there on time but we were sitting in the sun getting baked and there wasn't much that we could do um, similarly cold kills cold sucks and if at all possible like this coming weekend if it's cold and you're going out with your crews keep them warm if you're doing the warm up and you're warming up by fours, switch them quickly, okay? Keep them moving around. If you're just mulling around waiting for the start, keep them limber, you know, whether they're just doing dead water drills and they're moving or, you know, tapping drill or, you know, you can do some all eight light rowing, whatever it is, keep them moving because cold will affect you. The most important thing, and we're going to talk about it, is that you as the coxswain needs to be dressed for the weather. If it's hot, you need to be pre prepared, and if it's cold, you need to be prepared. Um, hey, look at this. This is an aerial of a sprint race, okay? So coxswain, 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 and there's a coxswain right there, okay? So this, this person right here has a clear shot across and they're almost open water on these boats. So if I was that coxswain, I'd basically give one more update about these people and I'd forget them. And then I'd move over here and look, okay? Because I'm going to see in my peripheral vision if that bow ball starts to come up on my, on my seat, I'll be able to see that. And then I'll go back to them, okay? But these guys are pretty much, you know, see you later, Charlie, I'm gone. Um, these guys, however, they're in the hunt, okay? So as the coxswain, you're given clear updates all the way across here. It's not every single stroke. I mean, you don't have to be color commentator Johnny on the spot, like, you know, but every 20, 30, 40 strokes. Does anybody know how many, how many, how many strokes are in an average 2,000 meter race? Anybody know? 250. Yeah, 250 strokes to get it right. That's it. Not a lot. Okay, not a lot. 250 to 300 strokes, depending on what your rating is. Okay. Um, so if you're giving updates every 20 or 30 strokes, you know, it's a clip. You're going down that race course. All right. A men's national team eight can pull a water skier. Um, that's how fast they go. The coxswains right here have good spacing. You can see some of the buoys right here, some of those, those lane buoys. Those usually have elastic on them, and when your oar goes underneath one, 
it'll pull that thing, it'll stretch with your blade, and then it'll go boing, and it'll shoot right off. As the coxswain, if you're going straight down your lane, you should have about four or five feet to either blade tip before you touch those buoys. So if your oars are over the buoy line into the other lane, you're still legal, but you're steering a terrible course, okay? You're still legal. If your hull crosses over into the other lane, but does not interfere with the other boat, you're still legal. If you interfere with the other boat and your hull is across the line, you're DQ'd, okay? This is sprint racing. This is not head racing. Um, so right here, you can see this coxswain is off course. See how much of a space they have here? He or she is steering too close to this buoy line. This guy is either moving over to give way to that or they're also coming over for some reason. That person looks like they're fairly straight on their course and that one does if I look at that. And you can see, see that, that uh, wake? See the, the puddles here and see the puddles here? There's a bigger gap right here and it's narrower there. You can see they're on their rudder and they're turning. All right, same thing here. You can see where what's happening right there in terms of the turning. So um, these two coxswains are probably playing off of each other. This guy is going after him right now. That person is focused on that one, which is a good strategy because that's the rabbit. That's the hound he's getting, he's chasing him. Um, and that's what you want to do is you really want to be, you want to take advantage of what's going to motivate you. Now this crew right here might be stroke for stroke with this other one. So you could have a little battle here, but every so often this coxswain's got to give an update here because ultimately this crew wants to know about that boat. That's really what matters. I mean, they want to, of course they want to be here, but right now they're slightly ahead. They've got maybe a half a seat. See where this bow ball is and that bow ball? That's about a half a seat distance. So that's halfway between this seat and that seat. So visually, you can use that as a landmark. Rowers know some distances. A full seat, half a seat, you know, I got a, I, I've got a deck on them, you know, two seats down, curvature of the earth, you know, that's, that's always a good one. Um, you know, so this is, there's a race plan that's going on here, you know, but the coxswain right now is deciding what they're gonna do. They stick with the race plan. Do they abandon it? Do they add to it? I don't know. You gotta make the call. It's your crew. You gotta decide in the heat of the moment, what am I gonna do? And if the coach feels good enough about you, they'll give you that. They'll let you run with that. They'll say to you, you know, Elizabeth, go ahead. If you feel like it's time to make a move and it's not in the plan, go ahead and do it. Make it, all right? But if you call something, you gotta have the confidence in the crew that they're gonna execute it. One of the worst things that can happen is if you call a 10 or something and you lose seats. Not good. Hey, what do you think he's doing? So as the coxswain, you know, he's pretty focused. He's kind of, I'm just going to talk about his body positioning. He's, he's wedged himself into the seat. He's got his butt back up here. See, he's, a, he's got a little bit, he's kind of firm in here, but he's leaning into his crew. Okay, he's leaning into that boat. He's not sitting back, umbrella drink, I'm all set, whatever, get me to the end of the line. This guy's, this guy's in it to win it, okay? Um, a lot of times, you need to remember you have a microphone system on, okay? So anything you say, can go across that microphone system. So even if you put your hand over the mic and you're like, you pull it away and you look at your stroke and you're like, I need you to get really long right now. And then you put it back, chances are the rest of the boat heard that. But you were trying to say that to your stroke to motivate them. So you either turn your cox box down or what you say you want everybody to hear. Okay, don't yell. There's a microphone, there's a volume, you can turn it up. Okay, if you want to yell, turn it down and then yell. But because of the nature of the boats that are the way they're made now is the decking, you know, you know, there's solid deck all the way down so your voice doesn't carry. Older boats, like if you look in like the Casper we have and some others, those are open, open hull. 
So when you yell, you used to yell down and it would travel up the, the, the boat. And that's how you would carry your voice. We don't do that now. We have this magnification system. The Cox box we'll talk a little bit about, but that's probably your most important tool. And it's probably mo the most underutilized. Most people just use it as a microphone. There's lots of other things to do with it. OK, what kind of race is this? That's a head race. OK. So difference, no lanes. Who passes who here? So this guy looks like he's overtaking this one. So he, this one needs to give way. This one, I don't know. He could be coming up on him. So they both, both may converge on this guy at the same time, in which case this guy's going to steer the longest course. They're going to have to go way wide. This one's a little bit wider. This guy should be sliding. You know, if I was him, I might slide over a seat. I'd make, I'd make it tough for him. I don't give up that easy. I'll, I'll show like I'm giving over, but I won't do it real easy. Eyes and ears. We're almost done, and then we're going to take a break. Um, and then we're going to come back for the second half. But command your crew, clean, clear voice. We talked about this. Listen to the officials and represent the crew. The only person that talks to the officials on land or on the water is and the coach. The coxswain and the coach. None of your crew should ever mouth off at any official. I don't care how upset they are. No one in the crew speaks, only you do. So you get the information, you give it to the crew. That's what you have to do. Be assertive on the water and the land, okay? It's your boat. Nobody snakes you on the dock. You, you're in line, you're getting in line. Um, you know, you, you make sure that everybody knows that you're, you're, you're there to race, okay? Um, you know, we're gonna be hosting crews next week, so it's important for us to be very good hosts, but at the same time, when you're on the water, you're a competitor, okay? So be assertive, but, but you know, do it within a certain level of decorum. You're responsible for everything. If it's raining, guess whose fault it is, okay? If it's cold, guess whose fault it is. If somebody forgot their water bottle, guess whose fault it is, all right? What you aren't is you're not, you're not the slave. You should not walk down to the dock holding eight water bottles. That's not your job. Another crew at a race brings the water bottles for them, or they put their water bottles in their shorts or their pants or somehow. Okay, at a race, crews support each other. So when you go to the dock, there's another boat that's sitting there with your oars, ready to walk them down onto the dock for you. So all you do is open up your oar locks, somebody's handing you your oars, they take your, they take your shoes, give you your water bottle, good luck, and you're off. It's just like at a NASCAR. When they come into the pits, everybody jumps on, gets the boat in and out, and boom, you're done. That's how it should be at a race. On the docks here, boats could be a lot more efficient in the evenings when we are rowing um, for the masters. We tend to sit and wait, and we're chasing daylight, and we burn time. You know, I've come in a few nights where we just make it to the dock, and as soon as we hit the dock, within five minutes, you can't see your hand. It's that dark. So we need to be efficient. But being responsible for everything is really the thing. If you're late to the line, guess whose fault it is? All right. If you mess up on the race, it's your fault. There's lots of things that come down. You don't always get the accolades as the coxswain. Okay, you win the race. Guess who won the race? The rowers. All right. <laughs> the rowers won the race. You happened to steer pretty well and made a couple of good calls, but damn it, my legs and arms pulled us across the line. Okay, that's what happened. Um, you lose the race, guess what? You screwed up. You, we needed a 10 back there and you didn't do it. You know? How come you didn't call that 10? You know, or God, you steered the worst course. We were all over the place, man. We lost 30 seconds off of that. Um, this we already talked about. If you don't like what's happening, you need to change it. Okay, you gotta change it. 
always be courteous to the officials. They will invite you back. They'll give you better spot next year for your trailer. They'll be closer to the docks. Okay. They'll make sure they're kind to you when you need a hot seat. But I'll tell you, if you're the jerk crew that shows up, they'll remember. And you're going to get the deepest, darkest corner for your trailer the next year. It happens. Motivate your crew. Know your crew. What motivates them? Everybody's different. So is each race, right? Different races have different meanings. In the fall, head racing is really about just understanding what your conditioning is. You're jockeying for position. How are you overall? Sprint racing in the spring is really what most people put their money on. Because you're starting from a dead stop. You got six minutes ahead of you. It's a dogfight. Who gets to the end? Who's got the strength? Who's got that extra little bit of mental capacity? Silence is a motivator. I'll tell you, I've, I've come up to crews and I just stare at them and I'll just drive away. And they're like, Tom's pissed. He's really pissed. I don't say a word, I just... And that's a motivator. Now, you have to understand complaining doesn't help your crew. Don't be a whiner. Oh my God, you guys, that sucked. It could have been a lot better. What happened? Well, that doesn't do anything, okay? We can do better as a crew. I felt it yesterday. I felt it earlier in the practice. This next time, this next two minute piece, we need to snap it together, all right, as a crew. So they understand that you know what's happening and you're sensing it as much as they are, but you're putting a name to it. If you're not organized, you're not going to motivate them. Oh, uh, I, I got to go get my cox box. Oh, uh, I forgot my hat. Okay. Or somebody in the crew is like, oh, I don't have my water bottle. You know, you got to get on that person. Three seat, why didn't, why didn't you bring your water bottle down? Okay. You know, how far away is it? Well, I got to go all the way back to the parking lot, blah, blah. Now you're sitting on the dock and now you're wasting, you're burning daylight and people can't get their boats out. Be assertive, rumble in the voice. Don't be a cheerleader, go team. Yay. Everybody gets a trophy. No, not everybody gets a trophy. Okay, doesn't work that way, sorry. Um, tap into the moment. If something great happens, let them know. If something bad happens, fix it. Find your signature phrase. I was racing my novice women's eight in the fall at Michigan. We were doing an inter-squad race <coughs> up against the varsity women's eight. And I'm sorry, it was the spring, not the fall. It was the spring. And we were just doing a short thousand meter piece. And the head coach for the, the, the varsity women was over on one side of the boat of the, the, the two boats and I was on the other side. And I, I, had, I didn't have a power megaphone. I had one of those you know long plastic cheerleader megaphones. I stole it from a Michigan cheerleader when they weren't looking. Um, I did, I swear to God, it just was white. So, um, and, cause I didn't like the power megaphones and I just, I had it near my mouth like this and my crew was going and you know, the, the, the terms of the race were full power at a set rating. That's what it had to be. So we were rowing at a 30 at full power for 1,000 meters. And all I said through this little, and I didn't know this until after the practice was, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I was probably 50 feet away from my shell, my, my women's eight. They heard me. And it's all they had to hear. And they jumped on the legs. We lost by a seat, but they said it was one of the biggest motivators they had heard all season. And I didn't even know they could hear me. I, we were firing on all cylinders, man. We looked hot. It was terrific. I mean, I was like, damn. 
So, and the varsity women are like, yeah, whatever. We weren't really pulling. I was like, okay. So, turn up the Cox box. Tell the other crew they're going to crab. Tell them that their seven seat is looking or their bow is looking over. Make, that's the time to lie. <laughs> and I say that in, in all honesty. You can, you can get the other boat to psych out. Because if their boat thinks that someone in their boat, if the, other, if the opposing team thinks that someone in their boat is doing something wrong, they're going to be like, why is Charlie looking? He's always looking. Why is he looking out of the boat? We're in the middle of a race. Why is he looking? And you don't know that, but you say that sort of stuff. And more times than not, you make them crab. So be sneaky like that, OK? When you're passing a boat, tell them something like, nice job, guys. Let's take it to full power now, OK? And the other crew is going to be like, what do you mean? They're not at full power. They're passing us. So. Um, Things like that. You learn these things. Here's a couple of things. This is one that lots of people think about. They think that they have to have the fastest, best boat made. But I tell my crews, it's not the carriage. It's the horses that pull the carriage. I can put a fantastic crew in a junk boat and make that thing speed down the race course. But I can put a junky crew in a fast boat and it's still a junky crew. Okay. This one's a fun one. You are first, you are champions, you are winners in three, two, one, and you cross the finish line. <laughs> so, but that's when, when you do something like that, that's really important. So, these are just, you got to find your own phrases. Um, here's a boatman. I think we take a break after this. Learn the parts of the boat. What's a rigger? Anybody know how to adjust a rigger? Anybody know how to adjust your seat? The slides? How to move the slides? Work it through the pin, things like that. Where should foot stretchers really be? I don't know. Uh, relationship of the oar to the rower. Inboard, outboard, where's the button, where's the sleeve? What does it mean? What's it, what if it's a windy day? What do I do with my oar lock or with my button on my oar? Should I do anything? You know, what if I have a lightweight crew, but I got to put them in a heavyweight boat? What do I do? Some of those things as a coxswain you need to know because it's going to affect how your, your, your crew is going to row. Learn basic repair and adjustment. It doesn't mean that you're responsible for rigging the whole boat, but if the coach, if you say to the coach, hey, four looks like they're going deep on the drive, I think they have too much pitch in their oar lock, that could be adjusted. Be responsible for the equipment. Um, each shell is unique. Things adjust differently. Know what they do. If your coach rigs, a lot of the boats here are shared, but in the event that they're ever dedicated to a specific crew, you should learn how to adjust that boat for that crew. Okay? Because it's really important. You can get literally seconds out of a boat when it's well adjusted. You really can. What's, what's a boat called? It's called the shell or the boat. There are obviously the oars. Does anybody know that there are different lengths of rowing oars, of sculling oars? I'm sorry, of sweep oars? There are oars made for women. There are oars made for men. Are they regulated? Nope. Nope. It's done by the crew. It's done by the size. Lightweight women are going to be different than heavyweight women, okay? Fat boys, heavyweights, you know, heavy guys, we call them fat boys. They'll, um, they'll have a different size oar than lightweight, okay? But then within there, there are nuances. There are different types of oars. 
You know, you've got hatchets, you've got you know, old spoons, you've got spaghettis. Um, riggers, those are all different. They come in every flavor, color, shape, size. Wing rigger, you know, tubular riggers, fixed riggers. Seat slide, those are different. Stretchers, woo, lots of things have happened there. Orlocks, big advances in the last 20 years on Orlocks. Skeg and rudder are even different. Um, Cox box, much better than when I was coxing. There's so many more bells and whistles with them. And a bow ball, that's really actually very important is to have that bow ball. Those, these are just some basic terms. No one races without equipment, period. Take care of it. If something's broken, tell somebody about it, okay? You don't wanna just be like, huh, well, I, broke the skeg off, the, rudder, off the, the boat today, I'll just put it on the rack. Nobody will notice, right? Well, no, they're going to notice that. Or an oarlock is missing, but you didn't mention it. Well, the next crew that picks up that boat is going to be like, wait a minute, what happened here? So there has to be that. That's something that I think as a club can be worked out better here is that there needs to be somebody who's on constant maintenance. Um, and things wear. Think about what you do every practice to those boats. There's a lot of forces on those boats, you know. And we just expect to pick them up and they work. Anybody ever seen a shot like this? These are typical things. Hey, there you are, coxswain. Um, foot plate stretchers, uh, side bed or slide beds, which are also called tracks. Seat, we know that. These long straight pieces are called the gunnels. Head between the gunnels. Have you ever heard anybody say that? You know, bow, stern. When you guys count off on the dock, you don't say one. You say bow. Your seat is bow. Okay? Rarely will a coach come up and go, one, you're doing this. They're going to yell and go, bow. This is what's happening. Stroke, that's your number. You're not eight, you're stroke. You're also bow, you're not one. Okay. Riggers, we talked about. Stroke, you know, port and starboard. How many people that row have ever coxed? Immediately when you get in the coxswain seat, do you reverse port and starboard? You do, because when you're sitting and you're rowing, you're like, well, you know, starboard's over here and port's over here, or you know, and or I'm sorry, starboard's over here and port's over here, and you, and then when you're coxing, you're like, no, so port and starboard is always viewed from the stern of any boat. That's how port and starboard came to be. It has nothing to do with the rower's perspective. It's always with the direction of travel. Okay, that's port and starboard. Very familiar. Front stay, back stay, main stay. Um, these used to be the creme de la creme of riggers. You know, they were all tubular aluminum, aircraft grade. You know, it was like, oh my God, you had this and you were like, oh. you know, now it's everything's carbon fiber, aero this, and it's like, oh. Um, so, very different. This little, this, this helps to adjust, you know, the orlock here for pitch. All of these things come into integral play when we're doing rigging. Ho! Oh, look at this. When I was a coxswain, we had stroke rating, and we sometimes would have a timer. Most of the time, it was just the stroke rating. And it was on and off, and it sounded like, you were listening to AM radio. It was always like, it's terrible. These things are so much more advanced. Stroke counts, you know, you can do splits, all kinds of different things. It's a terrific tool that you can use. Um, if, you know, Nielsen Kellerman, who makes these, they're really, they're the industry standard. I've never used anything other than that. Um, I, at Michigan, bought my own because the Michigan ones were used all the time, and I just, I, I just went out and I bought my own. Um, 
and it was worth it because it was mine it was always charged it was well taken care of the the ones here are fairly well taken care of but you know if you're really serious about it you might buy your own they're not cheap you don't have to buy the whole harness and everything but i think these things are up to i think just for the cox box and the headgear i think it's around 600 bucks now they're not cheap um you know they add the speakers and the wiring harnesses and they they get up there pretty quick dress for success warm weather you know still might dress in layers because you're sitting there have the basic set of tools for the boat um kim brought in her coxswain set and we're going to go through some of that a little bit but there's some things that you should just take with you it doesn't need to be you know a steamer trunk that you pull with you and put in there because a good coach will have a lot of tools in their launch okay so if something goes wrong they can come up and fix it but you do want to have certain things understand the weather tide local conditions is there a weather front coming in for the day is there tide going on is there going to be an antique boat show parade coming by sometime i don't know you know understand some of those things um when when i was with michigan we used to train down in at tampa for winter training we'd go down for spring break we were on the hillsborough river and there were times when the drawbridges would all go up to let the traffic through and the first day i didn't know that and so you know i'm coming through and all of a sudden i hear this big blast of a horn and then the drawbridge starts to go up and there's this line of pleasure craft you know coming down the other way and we just got waked like you wouldn't believe i mean because those things are like ba bathtubs working through the water they're huge they put out enormous wakes so that was something i didn't know about but then also it was a tidal river so um know who's out on the water make sure your equipment you and your equipment are ready to race and practice okay just like we talked about something's wrong don't go out you know don't expect to fix it on the water if something's wrong fix it on land that's a lot easier okay even if you have to pull the boat out of the water on the dock and put it in slings to fix it you have to do it okay um, know the plan what are you doing for the day that's really important be prepared okay being cold is worse than being hot okay i mean i had a foul weather gear set as a coxswain that had insulated it was bibs they were insulated and they had a shell on the top and they were fleece lined then i had a fleece lined coat and i had this big hat and I had gloves that were fleece lined and I had boots that were warm. And they'd be like, Weber, what are you doing? You weigh like an extra 80 pounds. You know, we don't want to haul that around. I'm like, dude, you want me warm, okay? Because I am, you know, I am not happy when I am cold. And, uh, um, and they were fine, you know. But similarly on race day, wear the minimal amount you need to to get by. But don't go out there and sacrifice the race just because you want to save an extra two pounds. Over the course of 2,000 meters, that's not going to save you anything. But it could cost you the race. Cox's, Coxon's toolkit. This is a little heavy. You don't need all of these wrenches. Typically, you need two wrenches, a 7 sixteenths and a 9 sixteenths. Here's a multi-tool. Um, I hate them because they're made out of cheap metal. Um, you know, but you could probably get by with two wrenches, maybe an adjustable wrench, a, a simple bag uh, is fine, okay? This is a little bit too much. This is like the Boy Scout, okay? I mean, you know, they're prepared for anything. Plus in here, there have got to be some wrenches and other things, but you don't need to have like, um, you know, like, hot hands are really for you but like sunscreen i mean come on really do you need the sunscreen like halfway through practice you're not going to be like oh tom i need to apply a little sunscreen sorry can we stop for a minute like you know it's like yeah pass it back it's like that's not going to happen okay i'll be like no now you just earned an extra piece and they'll be like oh thanks weber you know um but these are important dress in layers right here okay um you know dress in layers i don't care parts of your body are different i got like i don't know partial frostbite when i was little and my fingers and toes get cold really fast so i know i always have to wear warm 
toe stuff and warm finger stuff. All right, there's our break. All right, so I answered a couple of questions from some people during that little intermission, so feel free to ask me some questions. Again, stop me. I want to try to get through these next few things fairly quickly. When we get to the drills part, you're going to have to go to this packet. I was just telling everybody, I have a, a three ring binder here which has about 300 pages of articles. Everything from uh, physiological training, uh, rigging of a boat, uh, coxing, uh, coaching method, me methods, um, ideal stroke. So if there's a subject that you're interested in, I can make copies from this and you can leaf through here and look at it. I guarantee you, you'll, you'll never find these articles. These, they, they're not published anymore. So this is like a treasure trove of stuff. So I've, I've shared some things. I could have made this packet a lot thicker. But when we get to the portion in here about drills, you're gonna go to this packet. Okay, there's a section in here. And we're just briefly gonna go through them. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time but you can read through them and understand why, why they're important. This is only a sampling of drills. We, there are so many drills that are out there. So, okay? So, we're not there yet. You can grab the packet, but we're not there yet. So, anybody that's rowed for me, coxed for me, knows that I do drills. I might be in the middle of a workout and stop it and say we're doing a drill because something's not working. But typically the way I run a practice is there's a dry land briefing. Usually the rowers run by the coxswains. The rowers are warming up on land. So the coxswains run them through stretching and they'll run them through some warm up. You know, we do things that are called jumpies. I don't know what people call them now, but you, you'll go all the way down keep your back nice and straight and once your fingertips touch the ground you spring off the ground and then when you touch when you come back down you have to go down really slow and why are we doing that you're simulating the rowing motion so instead of this huh, uh, like that that has nothing to do with slide control so the whole idea is you're trying to learn slide control through doing an exercise and so 50 jumpies is typical to warm people up before they get hands on. Um, the beginning of any practice, I do a lot of drills. We do a set warm up and then we do drills. Depending on the season, if it's head racing, we do different types of drills than if we're doing sprint racing. Okay, in the summer, you still do sprint racing, but it's a different kind of rhythm to that. If you're doing racing for the high school and collegiate season, that really happens in April and May. Okay, there's a little bit in June. Um, so you have this condensed schedule. Once you get into the summer racing schedule, things turn to more club sports, you know, and it's a different routine. There's still sprint racing, but it's different. And then eventually you're transitioning from sprint over to head. So instead of being that sprinter on the running course, you've now gone to a marathoner in the fall. You follow me? So you're preparing your body for this long winter training routine where you're gonna go, you're gonna put some of that hardcore rowing to bed and it's now just about literally staying in shape, getting on the erg, running. We used to have a tower at Michigan. We would go to a parking structure Saturday mornings, 6 a.m., and it was six levels, and we'd run steps up and down, up and down, like 10 or 20. And then there was this one hill that we would run down and up, and down and up, and you'd do 20 you know, sessions or 10 sessions or whatever, and this was the worst. If anybody's ever been to Ann Arbor, the University of Michigan's football stadium seats 115,000 people. We used to run the stadium up a row, over and down a row, all the way around the stadium. So, stadium steps. We used to do that as part of winter training. Um, so it was all about conditioning. And 
That's really what happens in the winter. You're not going to get any better with your rowing in the winter, but that's what happens. So drills are so important because when you have a finite amount of time on the water, like we do in northern climates, you've got to make the most of your water time. So drills are where you teach the technical competence to the crew. How are you going to row competently so that for every amount of power you put into the stroke, you're getting it out in the boat, all right? Efficiency, technical expertise, and it's all about miles and drills. So you do those drills in the beginning, you turn around and you do the pieces or the workout and hopefully incorporate those things in there. So drills are used for some things. They could be used to isolate a single aspect of the stroke. Maybe it's for one rower. Some rower in your boat is having a particular problem, but everybody else has is correct except for this one rower. So the whole boat has to wait until you focus on that one rower. Because if that rower doesn't get any better, the boat's not getting any better. So you have to, as a boat, say, I have to be patient. This boat, you know, this rower needs this help or we're not going to go anywhere. So drills are for that. Maybe they're for the entire boat. So you have to learn what they're for. Listen to the coach and learn what they say. Learn what they're saying during that drill. Okay? We did a drill with the women. I did a drill with the women last Thursday. They were so eager to go really, really hard and really fast. And I'm just going to ask this group after I describe what it was. So we were in the pond. It was the best water. I had them rowing all eight. And we were going out at, it was right around a 24. Um, and they were at half pressure, okay, half to three quarters pressure. Um, and halfway through the piece, I dropped a pair out. And then I brought them back in after about eight strokes. Anybody know why I would do that drill? Shelly, do you want to say? Because you know the answer. It's to feel the weight of the boat so you really use your legs. There you go. <laughs> and so that when that oar goes in at the catch, you're feeling how heavy the boat is. And then when you join that pair back in, the boat feels really light. And so they learned what it meant to have so that that first stroke after you drop that pair out, they had to hump on those legs, just get on them, so that they kept the speed of the boat. And then they would go like three or four strokes. And then I added that other pair back in, and they got really light again. And they just sailed. Okay. But we did that for about a half an hour, and I looked at them, and I said, why are we doing this drill? And they were spouting off all, of it, all kinds of other things they didn't know until I said, because at the very beginning of the practice, I said, I watched them in warm-up, and they weren't connecting at the catch, and they weren't feeling the weight. And I said, we're going to work on that today. That's going to be part of what we're going to do. We did this drill, and I said, well, this is why we did it. Like, oh, my God, you're sneaky. And it's like, well, that's what you're supposed to do. But that's where the coxswain has to learn. So now they know why that drill is useful. They didn't know during the, that, but they experienced it all. They saw the results, and they're like, OK. Um, listen to the coach. Learn what it's about. When, is it, when it's good, it's good. And when it's bad, it needs to be improved. And so when I say that, I mean I want the, the coxswains and the crew to know that it's one thing to say internally, this sucks. We're rowing terribly. Okay, but how are we going to improve? How are we going to get better? How do we do that? And coxswains, you, may, you might sense something that the coach doesn't see. Speak up. When there's a pause in the practice, you know, Tom, you know, I know you think we're getting on the legs, but we're not. Or um, everybody seems to be just rowing a little bit short. Or I'm, I'm feeling, you know, I'm feeling like the boat is torquing a little bit at the catch. Those are the sorts of things that maybe the coach doesn't see. They might, and they might ignore it, but mention it, okay? It goes a long way with your crew that you're paying attention. I've done the tapping drill, I think, only with one or two crews here. But it's a great sitting stationary drill. You sit at the finish, and you just tap the oars. 
all eight. And if you're getting the oars out together and in together, the gunnel should be rock steady. But when it's off, you're going to be like this. And so they got to get the handle heights right. And then you go to arms away. And then you go to bodies over. And you go all the way up the slide. And a good crew, all eight at full slide at the catch doing this is the best thing to see. That's a stationary water drill. There's a whole bunch. But it works on set, handle heights, and rhythm. And you can do that if it's a cold day. Do that with your crew. Keep them warm. Always get every ounce, every minute out of a practice. Wow. There's a lot of drills here. If you want to refer to your sheets, you can right now. We're not, I'm not going to go word for word over all of these things, but I'm just going to go through basics of these. Um, and I talk about in, this, in, in these the purpose of the drill. And if they're good for a more advanced crew or for a novice crew, or if you want to do them by fours, eights, sixes, pairs, different things. Now, obviously, if you're in a four, you're only going to do it by pairs or by all four um, than if you're in, a, in, in an eight. So you just have to sort of do those. The, the best drill and the most basic drill is the pick drill. Does anybody not know the pick drill here? OK, so it's the core of my warm up. You always you leave the dock, you row away, you get to wherever you need to in the, 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 the lake, and you turn to whichever way you're going to go. And then you start from a dead stop and you do the bit pick drill. Right now, we've been doing it by fours. There are a couple of crews now that I would do it by sixes. Okay. The reason I like to do it by fours is it helps to isolate some things. But there are some crews that are moving well enough together that I would go to sixes. And as a coxswain, if you see a coach make that shift, they're giving you a signal that they have confidence that the boat is moving well enough as an entire boat that they can warm up by sixes instead of by fours. So that's a positive sign. Um, it's a good one. It gives you a good sense of how the boat's swinging, who's feeling dumpy and lumpy that day, and who's feeling charged. You know, um, So that's a really good thing. Quick hands. I've done this with some of the crews here. That really talks about being able to get the hands away from the body at the finish quickly and cleanly. Um, there seems to be a tendency um, in some of the crews that I've worked with here where they almost pause and then swing the hands away. And the, what's happening is at the finish, you've got all this momentum traveling to the bow, and you need to turn that momentum around. And you need to start moving your energy back to the stern, but under control. And the best way to signal to your body to do that is to get that oar out and around that corner quickly, but under control. And now I've just shifted the momentum from this way, right? Where I've engaged my core at the finish to I've swung it this way. And now I'm setting myself up for the next stroke. So those quick hands, and what you do is you start out Again, not by eights usually. Eights is for a very advanced crew. But up to as, as many as by sixes, sit at the finish, and you just row arms only. So it's square blade, arm only, and the coxswain calls it up. So up two and two. Now you're coming out a little bit quicker. Up two more and two. And you usually do three or four up, and then back down. And you have to land back where you started. Usually the starting pace is for what would be like an, an 18, where you'd be sitting at an 18. Most novice crews, when they first get out there, they row at about a 14. That's where they usually are. Sometimes they're at a 16, like very first month of rowing. And they think they're the cat's meow when they're rowing at a 20. Um, and they are for them. They need to know that. They're, they're, they are hot stuff when they hit a 20. Um, but come spring, you know, they, they laugh at themselves that they thought 20 was even fast. Outside hand only. Anybody know why we might do that? Big on, it's big, I'm saying this is my outside hand. I happen to be a righty. But when, I, when I'm up at the catch and I drive those legs, my, hand, my arm is nice and straight. And what's happening is I should feel the connection between that oar, the water, and then the power that I'm, I'm applying to that oar 
using this as my mechanism. So my legs are driving and my arm is the thing that's hanging on. So you should feel the weight of the water and you should feel the power that your arm can have all the way through the stroke into the finish. Key to this is that that inside shoulder has to be down and relaxed. If you've got square shoulders the whole way, um, it's, you're going to see people break their elbow early, okay? Or you're going to see them swing their bodies over too soon. So you need to be on the lookout for that. It's a great one to do with a little bit of pressure, like quarter to half pressure, because they can feel the tug. Um, excellent for like a mid, like novices, pure novices when you're getting towards the end of the fall, it's a good one for them. Easily for an experienced crew right out of the gate in the fall. Pause drills. Pause drills are good, but good for an advanced crew. You can teach bad habits with a novice crew. If you have them pause too soon in the teaching cycle, there you're going to have problems that you're just going to are just going to carry through the whole thing. So as far as the novices should be concerned, it's there's a constant motion to the oar. They're not stopping. But pause drills as you get further on into the development of a crew can teach the crew discipline for how to move from different positions together. So whether you're pausing at arms away, bodies over, half slide, there's this point at which the pause allows the boat to slow down and now they have to come into the catch even slower but they have to set that oar in and drive it and pick the boat back up. So they've purposely let the boat decelerate but for the purpose of gathering themselves. So the coach will look at where that pause needs to happen. Um, as a coxswain, if you're off on your own, you can cause a pause. You can call a pause drill, but you need to know why you're doing it. Just don't throw it in there because you happen to pull it out of your hat. You need to know why you want to do that. Feet out of the stretchers. This is really good so that people understand to keep engaged through the whole rowing stroke and that the abdomen at the finish is what's helping to hold them back instead of the tips of their toes. A lot of people will hold on by their toes like this and then that's how they get themselves pulled back up. And you want to not teach that. You want to keep the feet flat on the footboards all the way into the finish. So that's good. However, I will tell you this. If they don't do those quick hands away and their feet are out of the stretchers, they will fly into the bow and they will sail. They're going to crab, and then somebody goes over, and it gets messy. Um, square blades, big fan of this. Square blades as much as possible. Okay, It teaches handle heights. It takes the whole idea of having to worry about feathering and where the oars are going into something that's consistent so that you can set that oar in with a little bit of backsplash at the bow, and it can come out square and drip dry. Okay, because people when they add the feather, what will happen is they'll, they'll try to come out and feather at the same time and then they throw a lip or they crab. So you're teaching that, you're, you're taking one more component out and you're just saying we're just going to focus on that pure beautiful stroke. So that's a good thing for, for square blade. It's good for lots of other things but that's a typical one. Cut the cake, oops, cut the cake. Um, it's basically it's a scissoring drill with the hands. Again, it's a type of a pause drill, but you're not actually pausing. You're still moving constantly, but the boat, as far as the boat's concerned, it's slowing down. So this one has to be done with a little bit of power so that you can pick it up and move it on the next stroke. All right. Wide grip. When you're rowing, wide grip, you move that handle down the shaft. I say off the wooden handle because they used to be wood, but now they're all rubber. But you get down here and as you're twisting out, your, your shoulders are staying basically parallel to that, that, the, the, uh, the oar handle. And this shoulder is nice and relaxed if it's my inside one and my outside hand is going way out. So now I've got that outside hand grip and I'm dropped down like this and I've twisted from the waist. And it accentuates how you're turning and following the oar. It's really good for novices. Okay, but don't do it on day one. Like, 
you got to give them some you got to give them a month under their belt and then you can talk about that and even then you would do it by pairs more experienced crews fours and sixes is fine but it's a good way to remind them and rowers need reminding you know they might be rowing for three years and they still need reminding they're like oh my god you know um, tapping drill we just talked about five and glide done with power five strokes you pause at the finish and the first few times the coxswain gives the count one two rope and you do go through that a few times but then the coxswain will eventually drop out rotate through it's great if you do it by eights and if you do it by eights and it looks good man it's the best thing because when those oars touch and catch and they you see those legs get down with authority and the boat just springs back to life it's oh my god it's incredible to see so five and glide you give it that five strong solid hits with the legs and then you glide and let the rowers feel the boat move out and slow down and then you got to watch that slide control coxswains you really have to think about it they're going to want to shorten up because they're going to want to get that oar back in so that first stroke after the glide has to be long blind rowing closing the eyes freaks people out i'll tell you that um, the best part about it is it develops confidence but the first few times you do it People are going to get banged in the back. Someone's going to go faster and they're going to get hit in the rib by their, somebody else's oar. You know, somebody's going to bang their knuckle. I mean, there's going to be, it's just ugly. So don't do it until the crew is advanced, all right? It doesn't help to put a novice crew in that situation. They will panic in a heartbeat. Um, pressure drills. Oh, look at the rain. Is that rain or wind? Is the rain. So, yeah, so we're not going out. So the pressure drills, pressure drills are important because it teaches the crews what it means to drive with power. You might say, I might say half power and they're doing this and it's like, really, that's half power, you know? And then you get on them and they're like, well, no. And then they show you real half power and they're like, now that's better. So full power is a little bit of a misnomer because I guarantee you in the middle of a race, you're going to be going full power. But if I say power 10, where does that extra power come from? You got a little extra in the tank, okay? But full power should be full power. Um, half power really needs to, if you're in the coxswain seat, okay, let's, let's start. Paddle pressure, you can sit in the coxswain seat and the oars are just going through the water you know they have to go through with a little bit of power but really you're just moving the boat kind of up and down the water you're not going to feel much in the coxswain seat when i go to quarter power quarter pressure you should feel a little something getting pushed back okay like you're like it's a little wake-up call like oh okay there's a little power here half power you should get knocked back in your seat okay you should feel a bump. You start to think about, I gotta lock myself in. Three quarter pressure, you should really feel the boat jump. Rowers, you should hear the, the coach get on their motor and have to accelerate to stay up with you. And obviously full power is full power, okay? But varying pressure teaches the rowers how to get their legs down faster, okay? Now, if I increase the pressure, it doesn't mean I have to increase the rating, right? Big thing to watch for, coxswains. Your, co your coach will go, I want it at an 18. Uh, we're at an 18 on the paddle. All right, take the half pressure at an 18. Guess what? Next thing you know, you're on a 24. And it's like, no, back down to an 18. So pressure doesn't equate to rating change, okay? Rating drills. Again, this is a good one for slide control. Um, pressure changes is also good for that, but rating changes are important because 
they happen in a race all the time. You might be rowing along in a head race and you're, you're cruising at, a, let's say, a 30. And all of a sudden, you start to shorten up. You go into a corner. It's a little wobbly. People start to row short. And so you come out of the corner coxswains and you're like, we're still rowing short even though we have a straightaway. So you call them down to gather them. You say, we're at a 30, but we're short. We're going to settle to a 28, but I want, uh, I want to settle for 10 really hard at a 28. So they come out of that and they lengthen because they've been told to lengthen. And then they drive 10 hard and you're like, now we got it. Let's take it up to a 30 after that 10. So you have some gathering. So there are rating changes. And obviously in, the head, in, in a sprint race, it's the same way. Um, because you're going to come off of a start line at a certain rating. You might be at a 38 and then settle for the body at like a 30 or a 32. And then in the sprint, you know, as you're coming in the last 200 meters, you call it up. You know, and I've seen crews row at a 48 or a 46. I mean, talk about wanting your head to explode. It's like, that's really hard. Um, so rating drills are important. They teach discipline. And they teach you that ratings change first with the hands getting away quicker, then the body's swinging a little quicker, but always the last thing that increases is your slide. The slide is the last thing to increase in speed. Okay, teach that quick hands. That's where it happens. So in a in a practice, you might do quick hands early in the practice, and then work on rating changes because you want them to take this quick hands and translate it into now we're going to go to higher ratings. So you've already talked about quicker hands and you've incorporated that into a higher rating. Does that make sense? See how we're building on those drills. Okay. Um, so all of these drills are outlined in your packet. Okay. Take some time, look at them. Um, there are thousands of drills. So this is just a smattering. Um, but you should be familiar with them. Coxswains, if you're on your own, you can do a drill by yourself, but know why you're doing it. Don't just be next to a coach and decide, hey, we're going to do a pause drill. Okay, no. The coach makes those calls, not you. If you're on your own, you can make that call. All right? Racing versus practicing. The majority of the season is about training and practicing for a short race. Think about this. You row for 10 years. You practice, you race, you row for 10 years. You make the Olympics. Okay? You've got a, let's just call it a five minute, or I'm sorry, a six minute race. It's really not quite that. But let's just say it's a six minute race. Think about how many hours you trained for every second of that race. And what if you lose by one second? Would it have mattered if you stayed out there an extra 10 hours? So people train excessively for every second of the race, for every stroke of the race. You have 250 strokes to get it right. What if you slightly feathered your oar, slightly crabbed? Coxswains, same thing. What if you were off on your course? What if you missed your call? Okay. What if you were flustered at the start line, you know, when the little Boy Scout's holding your stern and pushing you in or pulling you, you know, trying to get you, their bow balls lined up and, you know, all of a sudden you hear this snap and you look around and you wonder what did he do, you know, but it took your focus off the boat for a second. So you got to practice, you got to practice like you're going to race. Practice gains seconds. Seconds gain seats and seats win. That's why drills matter. That's why drive matters. That's all of that matters. We just talked a little bit about this. But as the coxswain, you're putting in hours as much as the rowers are, but it's in a different capacity. Um, you know, you should still be fit. You should still work out. You should, you know, you don't want to show up, you know, holding a sub in one hand and a coke in the other and barking out commands. I mean, you know, the rowers need to know that you've got 
you know, the same amount of sacrifice in you that they have in them. And you're a crew. You're, you're a crew. As much as possible, I like to see a coxswain with a crew. What I don't like to see, and it happens, but I don't like to see is on race day, a coxswain just jumps into the seat and is like, okay, I'll get you down the course. Because that's basically what they're doing. They're, they don't know the crew. They don't know how to motivate the crew. They don't know what sayings work and who, you know, like three is always late and, you know, two can't, you know, get their oar under control for, to save their lives or whatever. They don't know that. But sometimes that's the situation. So you have to go with it. Um, so it's really important that crews have a coxswain. Um, and sometimes in programs you'll have a, an exceptional cox and that person will move from boat to boat on race day. It's not ideal, but sometimes they work the best with the crew because they are a really good coxswain and they can motivate. Any, any questions about this? I went through the drills really fast. Were there questions? Okay. Um, I, I, I like this, you know, a week before the race, you're already starting to plan for the race. You're starting to think about how you're going to get ready. What needs to happen? Do I need to adjust oar locks? What's, what needs to happen? Um, race plans, is that, does somebody have a sore back, an ankle injury? Anybody need to be nursed for anything? Those sorts of things. This is where we were going to go outside. Um, so. <laughs> Um, I just found this, I actually found this picture online, but that's, that's Michigan, so the men's program is the, um, is the, it's a club sport there now. Um, the women's program is varsity. Um, but this is always the joyous occasion you get to, when you win, a tradition is you throw your coxswain in to the water. Um, I remember 30 years ago when I was coxswain, whatever. Uh, for Michigan, and they 25, 30 years ago, and they threw me into the head. Of, they threw me into the Charles River, and I thought I was going to get hepatitis because it was so polluted. It was nasty. Um, but um, we're basically at the end of the presentation. So what I wanted to do was, I just I wanted to summarize this, and I just wanted to ask for questions. But the biggest thing that I want everybody to take away from this, rowers and coxswains and, and the coaches, is that. You know, the coxswain is, the, the crews can't really perform without a coxswain. Um, and the coxswain is dependent on making the crew work well together in order for them to win. So it's this really important relationship between the two. Um, so while you are supposed to be an assistant coach, you got to earn that. You don't just get it. So you can't just show up at the boathouse and start barking out commands because no one's going to respect you for that. You really have to earn that and learn and become assertive and take control of your crew. They will appreciate you for it. They really will. So anyway, I'm going to leave you with this last thing. Um, be the big dog. <laughs> okay? You, you guys, this is a great facility, a great program. You guys have a lot of opportunities here. I think, um, you know, building this program is going to be really important for, you know, for Leelanau County, for, you know, just for the opportunities that it's going to offer to people. So um, I hope to be back next year. We'll see. Um, you know, if you have questions, I'm going to give, I'm going to make, print out little contact business cards for people they can contact me. Thank you to these people. Are there any questions? People want to know, I'm probably going to put this online. It's a, Google's, it's a Google Slides presentation, so I'll probably share it. And then the, um, the, uh, you know, this packet can get scanned and put out there somehow. There are some people that wanted it. If you want to look at this, this is available. This is some of the, the articles on rigging and some other things. Um, this is the last week I will be coaching with people. Um, then we have the regatta, obviously, and then I don't know what happens next week, or the following week, I should say, after the regatta, but somewhere the boats get taken apart. 
Hopefully everybody is together for all of that. Okay. Um, if you guys want, I asked Kim to bring her coxswains kit. If you guys want to look in there, um, I'm sure she'll let you look in there and see what we've got there. But thanks to everybody, and I appreciate everybody taking their Sunday. So, thank you. You bet. Thank you very much, Tom. You're welcome.